How many enjoyed Vittles? Y'all from right around here, Vittles is dinner. It was good. Thank you all very much to the folks who fixed the food this afternoon. We appreciate it. And those who have brought the food in, we appreciate it. Well, have you enjoyed Barbara's program so far? Aren't you blessed? Tremendous. As we look at how simple God can make it for each of us to do and how powerful it is. We have two events I'd like to share with y'all. We have a how-to class. Who's ever come to our how-to classes? We have how-to classes. This one is is how-to. It's free. doesn't cost a thing. How-to gardening 101 class will be taught here. It will be um, Thursday night, February 23rd at 6 p.m. And y'all who go here know who our good gardeners are here. They'll be presenting the class for us. And uh, looking for healthy food, concerned about food availability, want a family project, concerned about food costs, looking for food security. Come to this class. It'd be great. Uh, Thursday night, February 23rd at 6 p.m. And then who's been to a dinner with the doctor? Excellent programs. And uh, this one will be on Vibrant Skin by Dr. Phil Mills. That will be April 11, April 11 at 6.30. Well, can we start with prayer, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your love and your care. Lord, thank you for these natural remedies that you've given us. Simple. And Lord, we thank you for Barbara coming and, and sharing her knowledge and uh, helping us to better understand how we can use these simple remedies. And, and as we're getting ready to better understand physiology, where it's so important, if we can attack it first through physiology, it, and we don't even have to go and, and deal with uh, the outcomes of signs and symptoms if we can ward it off to start with. But Lord, we ask that you bless as she speaks this afternoon, speak through her, that we, through her, that we can better understand the bodies that you've given us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back, everyone. I'm going to take you on a journey now. And this is a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. It's a very interesting journey and very misunderstood. As Proverbs 14 verse 6 states, knowledge is easy to him that understands. I want to give you an understanding of your gastrointestinal tract. It's an amazing process what took the food that we ate at lunchtime today and converts it down to microscopic little particles that get taken into the blood and then the blood takes it to the cell where it, it uh, serves as fuel. We have 100 trillion cells in our body and 25 trillion red blood cells and Leviticus 1711 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood is what carries the nutrients from the food that we ate and, tr and carries it into the cell. There's an interesting book called Body by Science by Dr. Doug McGuff, and he's a physician that uses exercise and a lot of natural things. And he was asked the question, what's the most important, diet or exercise? I presumed he would say exercise. He said 80% is diet. Because the food we eat determines what is delivered to the cells. So let us begin our journey. We're going to begin with the mouth because that's where it goes in. And the mouth is the only part of our body that we have say over. We have say over what goes in. We have say that, that when I say what goes in, whether this much goes in or this much goes in. We're the ones that have say. And you know where the decision is made? In the prefrontal cortex. If I'd said that to you yesterday, you wouldn't have known what I was talking about, would you? That's where we make the decisions. We have say what goes in, meaning whether it is uh, healthy food, plant-based food, or whether it is refined food. We have say over what goes in, we have say over how much goes in. We have say over when it goes in, whether it's every two hours or whether we give the body, and you'll see in a minute when we look at the stomach, it needs a break between meals. We also have say over the environment of entry. Is it rushed? Are you running along while you eat? Or are you eating in a peaceful environment? Or are there controversial issues being discussed while you eat? All of that affects the digestion. 
So the mouth's a very important part because it's the only part we have say over. The other important part of the mouth is it's the only part of the body where we have exposed bone. Have you noticed? That's your teeth. And your teeth have a very important function. It's called chew. <laughs> and it's, it's, a forgotten, um, it's a forgotten talent. Is that right? <laughs> My husband does everything fast, 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 drives fast, everything's fast. But you know, you really appreciate it because he's a mover and shaker, he gets things done. But he eats very fast. And sometimes when he finishes his meal, he says, I've won. <laughs> I said, no, no you haven't. <laughs> you ate too fast. Hmm. So often when, I'm, when we're eating and I, I see that he's, his mind's up ahead, you know, uh, planning what he's going to do next, and I touch his arm, and I just, he goes, oh, puts the knife and fork down and chews nice and slowly. We should chew until our food is almost liquid. Have you heard the old saying? We should um, drink our food and chew our drinks. Have you heard that saying? And we say this to our guests on the juicing days. They should take a mouthful of their vegetable juice and swill it in their mouth a little bit and then swallow it. So that what, that's what it means when you drink your, I mean, chew your drinks. But our food should be almost to a cream before we swallow it. Dr. Kellogg, I remember reading in his books one day, that little bit of nut that you didn't chew properly is just going to come out the other end. So you're not going to be able to access the nutrients. What chewing does is it breaks the particles down, to, down very small that means a larger surface area for the enzymes to work on. But you know what it also does, chewing? It tells the brain what's coming. So as you're chewing, the, the brain's getting an assessment. Oh, we've got a bit of fat there. Oh, we've got a bit of protein there. Oh, we've got a bit of minerals there. Oh, we've got some, some carbohydrates there. And that allows the brain to contact the other organs and tell them what's coming. But if someone goes choo-choo, swallow, choo-choo, swallow, choo-choo, swallow, the organs are waiting to get a message from the brain. And the brain says, I don't know what's coming. They're just chewing too fast. So there are many reasons why it's very important to chew, chew, chew. Digestion of some food begins in the mouth. And we're going to have a look at what, ha what begins in the mouth. Saturated fat digestion begins in the mouth. So what's a saturated fat? Coconut, palm oil, cocoa butter, uh, butter. They're your basic saturated fats. And there are some nuts and foods that have a little bit of saturated fat. Avocado has a little. Uh, macadamia nuts have a little. Their breakdown begins in the mouth. Underneath the tongue, there are sublingual glands. And sublingual glands release lingual lipase. And lingual, lingual lipase is the enzyme that breaks down saturated fat. So let's say coconut oil is unique in that the breakdown begins in the mouth. So we're going to start by looking at the mouth. We're going to look at the pH. The pH of the mouth is alkaline. And you'll see as we go down the gastrointestinal tract that the alkalinity can change a little. So the enzyme is lingual lipase. Lingual lipase, which is released from the sublingual gland just under the tongue. And the food is saturated fat. It's the saturated fat, it's unique, no other fats saturated. There are no other fats that break down in the mouth, only the saturated fat. There is another food where the breakdown in the mouth is essential for its breakdown, and that is starch or carbohydrates. So they're all your pastas and your breads, your cereals, potato. So the enzyme that breaks that down is it's a salivary amylase called tylen. And tylen is the enzyme that breaks down starch. But there is minimal tylen present in the human mouth until the molars appear. 
So the first teeth a baby gets is four at the top, four at the bottom. They're called milk teeth. And do you know why they're called milk teeth? Because that's what babies should be having, milk. And then, so they appear maybe around seven, eight, nine months, and it might take a few months for all four to come through. And then the next teeth that come through are the molars, so they come back a little bit further. Molars grind. What do we grind? We grind grain. So when the molars are through, and only then is tylen released in the mouth. So babies should have no, no starch until the molars are through. And yet, what are mothers told to give their babies at six months of age? Cereal, rice cereal, what's that? Pure starch. And it's all mashed up. Why does it have to be mashed up? Because there's no teeth. For a baby to eat food, there needs to be three things present. And this is where common sense comes into the equation. Remember that forgotten one, common sense? They can sit. They can actually feed themselves and they can chew because they've got teeth. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in lying on my back and being fed slop. And isn't that what so often happens with babies? Now, I heard this when my first baby was only six weeks old. I got to know a... a he was a charge nurse in charge of the uh, malabsorption syndrome ward at... Um, Children's Hospital in Sydney. He said, the ward that I'm in charge of is full of babies who've been fed starch too young and they have malabsorption syndrome in the gut. So I was very glad to hear this because this greatly influenced the way that I fed my babies. Anyway, my second baby, James, he was not interested in food till he was 16 months old. Oh, 16 months, he's running around. Here's this little boy running around, never eating food. Do you know that was not uncommon 100 years ago? Do you know what that means 100 years ago? Let's look at 500, let's look at thousands of years ago. Do you know that means Einstein, uh, Mozart, Bach, all these brilliant minds, they didn't get food till they were sometimes two or three years of age. And yet what women have been told today, you must feed your baby food. Or, or your baby won't develop properly. That, that defies reason. And another theory is that breast milk doesn't contain enough iron in it in the second part of the first year. Well, do you know what my response to that is? Has God made a mistake? God makes no mistakes. And so the Nursing Mothers Association, they quote a few um, medical experiments on this. And they quoted one experiment where all the babies were given iron in the second month of age, equivalent to the iron in the first six months of age, and they all got diarrhea. You see, the body's requirements for iron in the second six months aren't as great as they are in the first six months. I get emails from young mothers all the time saying, I'm getting so much pressure because I'm not feeding my baby food. So I said, you know, your best argument is we're very happy with the development of our baby. We're very happy with the development. <laughs> and then just change the subject. Because then the molars come through and you can start feeding the baby and then, then everyone relaxes. One lady said, where can I get this information? I said, go to any admin physiology book and have a look at the teeth and have a look at when the teeth appear and have a look at the enzymes that come when the teeth appear. I don't know about in the US, but in Australia, all baby feeding, you know, all the baby foods they have, do you know, do you know they're, they're made by Heinz baby food, and then you get a brochure of Heinz baby food, and what are they pushing? Food at a young age. The great deceiver is even busy in feeding baby food. Isn't that interesting? And one of the reasons so many have gut problems today is because often they were fed food too young as babies. The later, the better. So now we're going to go through the cardiac sphincter. So that's the little sphincter. And it's called the cardiac sphincter because of its nearness to the cardiac or the heart muscle. And you talk to any emergency nurse, the amount of people that come in thinking they're having a heart attack when they've actually got reflux or heartburn, they've got this pain right there. 
But God designed in such a way that there's a double laid valve there, so it's very effective at keeping the food in the stomach because the fact is the pH of the stomach is acid. So if someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, my response to that is fantastic. It's supposed to be acid, and you will see why in a minute. We had a lady do our program, and her whole of her esophagus was ulcerated because the acid kept coming up. So she was given antacids. She was given medication to stop the acid. I said, what's going to break the food down now? We need to have an acid stomach. The problem's not an acid stomach. The problem is this valve. So why would the valve be weak? Uh, because the person's eating all day long and eating their largest meal at the end of the day and then when they lie down to go to sleep, the food pushes up against that cardiac muscle, weakening it. And it is a muscle, and when it's relaxed, it's closed. When it tightens, it opens. So stress. If a person's stressed out, that will tighten every muscle, even the cardiac sphincter. And so it's very simple. We've seen many people heal from this. You have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper, or you call it supper, don't you? One lady said, what do paupers eat? I said, sometimes nothing. <laughs> and at the same time, take magnesium. Magnesium is a muscle relaxant, and it'll relax that, that little valve there. We get people come with reflux, and they go home without it. And that's, that's, that's all we do. So now we're down into the stomach. The stomach has large folds like this. And those folds are lined with gastric glands. And two thirds of those gastric glands release mucus. And this is a thick, this causes a thick mucosa mucosal wall over the lining of the stomach to protect the lining of the stomach for what's released down here in the parietal glands. Down here in the parietal glands are released hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. And when hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen unite, they release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. Isn't it amazing the way God made the body? If we give it the right conditions, everything works very, very well. So the hydrochloric acid is very important. In my book, Self Heal by Design, I have a chapter called The Stomach's Secret Weapon, Hydrochloric Acid. Hydrochloric acid has a few functions. It's antibacterial, it's antifungal, it's strong antimicrobial, so that if any bacteria or yeast happen to be on the food and it gets into the stomach, that hydrochloric acid can wipe it out. One drop of hydrochloric acid on your skin will burn a hole in your skin. But God, in his wisdom and mercy, put all of these mucosal glands so that there's a thick mucosal lining over the stomach, and so the stomach is not hurt. And the hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogen, they unite inside the stomach, in here, to release pepsin, and then that pepsin is what breaks down the protein. Something else is released in the parietal glands, and that's the intrinsic factor. So what's the intrinsic factor? The intrinsic factor is required to be able to absorb our vitamin B12. In his book, Proof Positive, Dr. Neil Nedley, he shows that organically grown fruits, no, sorry, not fruits, organically grown root vegetables, contain vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is an airborne bacteria, so if you do have an apple tree and you pick that apple and you eat it, you're getting some B12. I don't wash it because what's the point in washing it? Now, if it had spray on it, you'd need to wash it. So when I pick my uh, parsley, I don't wash it unless it's got dirt on it because those, it's an airborne bacteria. So when you're eating from the garden, you're eating some vitamin B12. You do not need very much. When we wake up in the morning, because it's a bacteria, there is a little B12 in our mouth. That's why you should never clean your teeth when you wake up in the morning. Have a big glass of water, you'll get a little bit of B12 there. 
<laughs> and your hydrochloric acid isn't that active yet because it only is activated when you smell, think, food and start to eat. Then, then the enzymes are released. B12 is bound up with an R protein in food. And when you eat food with B12 in it, the hydrochloric acid releases the R protein from the B12. And then the B12 floats down all through the small intestine. As the intrinsic factor floats down all through the small intestine, and in the last part of the small intestine, called the ileum, the B12 and the intrinsic factor unite, and then the B12 is absorbed into the body. When it gets absorbed into the body, it goes into the enterohepatic circulation, hepatic meaning liver. So there's a, circu there's a circular system happening there. So you can get someone that's taking no B12 into their diet, and they cannot show a deficiency for 30 years. <laughs> because of this storage of B12. It's only, the, it re, it's releases as we need it. Most people that have low B12, it's not because they're on a plant-based diet, it's because they have low intrinsic factor. So when you've got low hydrochloric acid, low pepsinogen, low intrinsic factor, they basically all come together. But if the stomach's given the right conditions, the parietal glands will be faithfully releasing those. So then the next question is, what depletes or what causes low hydrochloric acid, low pepsinogen, low intrinsic factor? Eating all day long? Drinking with the meals? When you drink with your meals, you dilute hydrochloric acid. You see, digestion in the stomach is a chemical process and water dilutes every chemical process. We should stop drinking water half an hour before the meal and resume drinking water about an hour and a half to two hours after the meal. When you want to drink water straight after the meal, that is a clear indication you sat to the meal dehydrated. That's why I say to parents, get your children's drinking. <laughs> it's an hour to lunch, get them drinking, get them drinking, get them drinking now. Otherwise, they will want to drink, drink, drink lots straight after the meal and that dilutes the hydrochloric acid. And digestion slows down because digestion can't happen unless it's in an acid environment. And this connection of hydrochloric acid and, pep and pepsinogen, it doesn't happen unless it's in an acid environment. And pepsin only works in a very acid environment. That's why if someone says, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, great. Did you know that dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid of humans? and they don't have stomach ulcers or reflux. No, the acid is very, very important. I have never met anyone with too much hydrochloric acid, but I have met a lot of people with low hydrochloric acid. How do you know if you've got low hydrochloric acid? It's been four hours since you've eaten and you still feel full. Digestion is very, very slow. And also, bloating. See, because digestion's not happening very quickly and you're in a warm environment, then fermentation can start to happen and, and that can be the bloating. How can we boost hydrochloric acid? By leaving gaps between the meals. There's been a lot of research, quite a bit done at Loma Linda University, that shows that digestion, digestion averages between uh, three and four hours. And then the stomach loves a rest of one hour. So I personally like to leave five, sometimes six hours between meals. And as you'll see as we go through our gastrointestinal tract, the majority of digestion and absorption into the blood is happening in our small intestines. So even when your stomach's happening, you're still getting nutrients. <laughs> There's a book called One of the Body's Many Cries for Water by an Iranian doctor, Dr. Batman Geheldich. We'll call him Dr. B. And his other title to his book is He's Not Sick, He's Thirsty. And the other title to his book is Don't Treat Thirst with Medications. Often when we get a hunger pang halfway between meals, it's usually thirst. And I remember my son Peter came to you one day and he said, Mom, the water's not doing it anymore. I looked at the clock and I said, great, it's mealtime. 
In other words, if you're hungry between a meal, just drink water, just drink water, just drink water. And when the water doesn't do it anymore, it's usually time to, to eat a meal. The most popular way of eating in nutrition today is time-restricted eating. Have you heard of it? 5-2 uh, diet, uh, intermittent fasting, they're also talking about it. Do you know that's exactly what Ella might told us to do? In this time-restricted eating, TRE they call it, it's eating two meals six hours apart in a 24-hour period. Does that sound familiar? And they're finding that when people implement this, blood sugar levels stabilise, weight drops, blood pressure starts to drop, people start sleeping better. But what they advise is eating a meal at one o'clock and then a meal at seven o'clock. And I talked to one lady and she said, I'm fainting by 10 o'clock in the morning. I said, yeah, I would be too. And she said, and I can't sleep probably because I eat a big meal at seven and my, you know, there's too much food in my stomach. See, when the sun goes down, our whole body slows down and digestion slows down. Our stomach is better prepared for a meal in the morning and at lunchtime than it is in the evening. So the time-restricted eating, this is what we do at our health retreat. We give breakfast at 1.30, we give lunch at 1.30. So 7.30 breakfast, 1.30 lunch. And then in the evening we serve a broth, like a thin, a thin soup. What some people choose to do is have breakfast at nine and then the next meal is at three o'clock in the afternoon. And some people say, but Barbara, my kids are at school all day, my husband's at work. And I said, well, give them a mighty breakfast, <laughs> give them a medium-sized lunch, and then when they come home, have soup, have soup. So ha have something maybe just a little lighter. Or sometimes some people choose smoothies, just something light at night. And that helps the stomach. But how can you boost hydrochloric acid? Absolutely drinking water between meals, absolutely spacing out your meals, absolutely having most of your food in the earlier part of the day. But there are herbs that will boost it. Cayenne pepper, that'll wake anything up. Have a quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little water just before the meal. Dr. Kellogg says, have a quarter of a cup of very hot water just before the meal. Or you could, make, you could improve on that and have a squeeze of lemon in the hot water because lemon is acid. So there are a couple of things you can do to give your hydrochloric acid a little bit of a boost. So the stomach needs a rest between meals. It needs to be allowed to digest efficiently and effectively. So the food that is broken down in the stomach, and there is only one food that is broken down in the stomach, and that's protein. And it's broken down by pepsin. So in the stomach, in that acid environment, pepsin breaks down protein. Starch digestion began in the mouth, but it was put on hold in the acid environment. Now we come through the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is the little valve at the end of the stomach. When you wake up in the morning, your pyloric sphincter is open. That's why the best time to drink is early morning. And, and if it's warm, it goes through very, very, very quickly because your pyloric sphincter is open. But when you smell, taste, think food, that little pyloric sphincter closes up, ready for food coming in. The food comes in, it is uh, digested, and then little by little, it's allowed to come out. But if food comes in too often, let's say we've got a breakfast here, and it's little by little starting to go out, and then mid-morning someone has a biscuit and a cup of tea, or a sandwich and a cup of tea, isn't that usual of so many people today? Or maybe they're really healthy and it's an apple and a handful of nuts. Whatever it is, when it comes in, pyloric sphincter says, shut the gate, something's just come in, it's not broken down yet. And it will not open until this food is broken down to the state it should be. Ah, then it'll start going through. So a little bit more goes through. And then, oh no, it's lunchtime. Quick, shut the gate. Lunch has come in. One of the ways to disrupt digestion 
<laughs> is to eat all day long. But what about children? Well, I breastfed my babies till they were about two and a half, the last baby till three, and they would go down for a sleep late morning and they would have breast milk. And when they woke up, I'd give them a little water and then they'd have their lunch. But I find if you give a meal that is high in the three essential food groups. So number one essential food group is fibre. It's, it's essential because, as you'll see as we get down to the colon, you need fibre to stimulate peristalsis. You need fibre to help clean out any little pockets. Fibre is essential, and it is the fibre part of food that you'll get a concentration of a lot of your nutrients. Protein is an essential nutrient. 50% of the membrane around every cell is protein. The new cell is made up by amino acids. That's a breakdown from the protein we eat. My son James, he was born with my body type, which is very hard to put on weight, and no boy wants that. Well, he's built like a bodybuilder today. How did he do that? <laughs> he worked out and he supplemented with protein. Every bodybuilder knows if you want to build muscle, you've got to have protein. So what's the best protein? Well, God told us in Genesis 1.29, the seed. So your legume, nuts and seeds. They're the best proteins because they're the lowest in carbohydrates. We'll look at that a little bit more when we look at diabetes next. The other is fat. And nuts and seeds are an excellent source of fats. These are three essential food groups. Fat is essential because 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is fat, except for the brain cell. The membrane around the brain cell is 70% fat. It's the fattiest organ in the body is the brain. And the brain loves fat. And that's how the ketogenic diet works. It breaks down the fat in the liver to ketones. And fat gives more than twice the units of energy compared to glucose to be burnt as fuel. So they're the three essential food groups. And so breakfast, fiber, fruit's a great way to start breakfast, nuts and seeds. My husband and I love having legumes on toast for breakfast. We do the sourdough. Uh, and I'll, in my next lecture, I'm going to talk about wheat. I'm going to talk about what they've done to the wheat and the different wheats. We have avocado, so there's a good source of fats as well. I have olive oil on my bread, another great source of fats. So you see, that's a complete protein. So when my little grandchildren come and stay for, st come and stay for holidays, which they did recently, oh, they love their lentils and avocado on toast for breakfast, and I do not hear from them five hours, sometimes six. We've got a beautiful creek, so they play in the creek all day. When they get hungry, they come. I don't see them for five to six hours. As a mother, I was not interested in being in the kitchen all day. I've got too much to do. So you feed them well, you don't hear from them. That's the good news. Now, if you're not an early riser like I am, and you don't have time to cook legumes or maybe whole grains like millet, put them in a crock pot. Crock pot overnight can be an easy way to do it. These are the three foods that keep the food in the stomach longer. Fibre, because it slowly releases the glucose. Protein, because it's in the stomach that protein is broken down. Fat, because it slightly coats the food, so it takes a bit longer to, to digest, and that's what we want. <laughs> the stomach wants a five to six hour break between meals. We had a lady do our program and she said, Barbara, you don't understand, I've got a bag with me the whole time and I eat all day long. If I don't, I get hypoglycemia, I faint, I've got to have my little bag of food. And I said, oh, that's all I said. <laughs> the two days of juicing, we serve uh, usually carrot, celery and apple juice as our main juice. Some juices have a bit of beetroot, some a bit of ginger, some a bit of cucumber. Cucumbers, on, when they're on tap, there were cucumber every juice, which we've just had. She went quite well in those days. And then on those two juicing days, on Wednesday morning, our guests break their fast on vegetables. We have a raw vegetable platter, we have hummus, we have avocado, we have some baked sweet potato and some lightly steamed cauliflower and broccoli. 
So that is breakfast. So where's the fibre? Well, everything has fibre. Where's the protein? In the hummus. Now, this meal has to be the lightest because they're just breaking their fast. And, uh, and some of the baked vegetables. You see, raw food will deliver what cooked won't. And cooked will deliver what raw won't. I myself aim for 50-50, half cooked and half raw. And we didn't hear from that lady till lunchtime. And we did encourage drink water between the meals. And, you, and at, the, at the main meal, there's always a big salad. There's always a legume dish. It might be chickpeas or lima beans or black eye beans or cannelloni, kidney, so many legumes, so many, such a variety you can have. We always have some baked vegetables too, again, looking for half raw, half cooked. And at night she had the broth, I didn't hear from her. At the end of the week she said, I would never have believed it. She said, I've had no hypoglycemia, that's low blood sugar. She said, I haven't really been hungry until half an hour before the meal. She said, I would never have believed it. But she said, coming here and eating the food you have, she said, uh, I now realise that I can do it. If a person has watermelon for breakfast, well, we've got a bit of common sense. We've got to use our common sense. They're going to be hungry within about two hours, isn't that right? <laughs> but watermelon can be a nice evening meal, <clears throat> unless you want to get up every couple of hours. <laughs> I just said to my friend, I'm just going to the water closet. You don't have that. That's, I drink a lot of water, and in the water closet, you let it out. New word for you. So now we're coming through the pryloric sphincter and we're coming into the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. And in the duodenum, there's quite a few things happening. And in the duodenum, it's an alkaline environment. So there's only one part in the body that should be acid and that's the stomach. Body waste can also be acid. So in the duodenum, we've got the pancreas. The pancreas lives under your left rib. And under our right rib, we've got the liver. The liver's the largest internal organ. So, sorry if I didn't draw it to make it look bigger than the stomach. It actually is. And so what's happening here, the, the gallbladder sits under the liver, and the gallbladder is a reservoir for bile. That's what it is. And if someone has had their gallbladder out, their liver is what makes the bile. So they're still getting bile. But the gallbladder is a reservoir. And you'll notice that the bile duct comes down to the neck of the pancreas. And then it releases bile into the duodenum. And the pancreas releases a few things which we'll list. So first of all, we're going to look at liver. So the liver releases bile. And if anyone's been sick with vomiting over a while and start to vomit up green, that's usually bile. <laughs> it's green. And bile breaks down. It emulsifies polyunsaturated fats and the monounsaturated fats. Do you remember where saturated fats were broken down? In the mouth. So. The unsaturated fats are broken down with bile in the duodenum. Under the action of bile, that was made in the liver and stored in the gallbladder. Now let's look at pancreas. What's the pancreas releasing? The pancreas releases a few things. It releases pancreatic lipase. Now, do you remember up in the, ma in the mouth, it was sublingual lipase that broke down saturated fat? Lipase is the enzyme that breaks down fat. So in the pancreas, pancreatic lipase, it further breaks down those unsaturated fats. The pancreas also releases pancreas, pancreatic amylase. Now, do you remember back in the mouth, Back in the mouth, it was salivary amylase called tylen that breaks down the starch, and that got put on hold in the acid environment. Now we're coming back into an alkaline environment, 
And in that alkaline environment, under the action of pancreatic lipase coming from the pancreas, the starch is finely digested. So the starch begins in the mouth and it's finalised down in the duodenum. But that's not all. The pancreas also releases pancreatic trypsin. And the pancreatic trypsin finalises protein digestion. You remember where protein digestion began? Protein digestion began in the stomach. And then it's finalised with the pancreatic trypsin and also chymotrypsin. That's another type of trypsin. And it also breaks down the protein. OK, students, I have a question for you. What organ is the main organ of digestion? It's the pancreas. Is that right? It's the pancreas. Because the pancreas finalises the, the unsaturated fats, the pancreas finalises the starch, the pancreas finalises the protein digestion. So if someone has pancreatitis or cancer of the pancreas, if you'll notice, they die very quickly. And you know why they die? They die from malnutrition. Because the pancreas can't finalise these essential nutrients. And if they're not, if the digestion's not finalised, it can't get into the blood. And if it can't get into the blood, it can't get to the cell, or they die from malnutrition. That's usually a death that happens very quickly, and that's why. Because they cannot finalise their digestion. The pepsin and the trypsin and the chymotrypsin are called proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic enzymes are enzymes that break down protein. And God, in his wisdom and his mercy, he put proteolytic enzyme in some foods. One is bromelain in the core of the pineapple. So as my friend was cutting up the pineapple this morning and digging out the core, I went, ah! <laughs> That's the best! <laughs> what we do is we cut a slice of pineapple and we cut it in wedges, then everyone gets a tiny little bit. Because most people don't like it because it's hard. Well, do you know our teeth need, they need to be, they need something that they can chew. This strengthens the teeth and the gums. That's why hard food is very good for the gums and the teeth. Another reason why you shouldn't give babies slop. <laughs> they should be given food they can chew. And of course, they have to have teeth first. You also will find a proteolytic enzyme. It's called papain. It's in the papaya or the popo. And you can buy digestive enzymes. And if you read the label, it's got papain and bromelain in it. So you'll know that that's come from plant. If you get a digestive enzyme and you see porcine in the ingredients, don't touch it because that's from the lining of the pork stomach. You don't want that. But you can get vegetarian enzymes. So anyone with pancreatic problems, they should be on a digestive enzyme every meal to help break down their food while the pancreas starts to revive. When people are eating all day long, and I find it interesting that nutrition today are telling people, no, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Because what is it, 30, 40 years now, people have been told to eat all day long. But we as Adventists know that Ellen White said, no, no, no. Just eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. Now science is backing that up. But when people do eat all day long, it does put a load not only on the stomach, but also on the liver, also on the gallbladder, and also on the pancreas. So to make it easy for these organs, we adhere to the guidelines on how to treat the stomach properly. Now we're coming to the grand finale. 
the grand finale of digestion is when the nutrients are taken out of the gut and into the blood. Did you know that your gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube? And anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets out of the gut and into the blood because it's the blood that's the life of the flesh. That's why a lady said to me, I don't know what to do about my little boy. He's got a cold and he sniffs. He's sniffing it all and swallowing it. Won't that hurt him? I said, he's just going to the hollow tube and he's just going to come out the other end. So what's the grand finale of digestion? The grand finale of digestion is happening in the small intestine and the small intestine aligned with villi. And up in the middle of the villi is a lacteal, that's part of the lymphatic system. And all over the villi is a blood capillary network. In fact, the more this is magnified and seen, there's even little villi on the villi. It's quite an incredible process, digestion. I'm keeping it as simple as possible. When we were in our mother's wombs, our gut was sterile. There was no bacteria in our gut. And when we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. I was watching a, sh a documentary on gut flora, and they had an obstetrician there, and he said, we always thought God made a mistake, putting the birth canal and the anus so close to the point that we used to give every woman an enema when she was about to give birth to her baby. Notice what he said, we thought God made a mistake. He said, we now know it's a perfect design. Because when, when the birth canal stretches open for the baby to come out, well, the anus stretches open too. And the air coming out of there, that's the baby's first breath. <gasps> and they swallow and they're getting all that lovely bacteria down into the gastrointestinal tract. Do you know what they're finding? That children or babies born via cesarean section have more skin flora in their gut than gut flora. So if a baby is born via cesarean section, a mother should get a probiotic powder painted on her nipple for the first breastfeed every morning. Now the first three days after the baby's born, there's no apparent milk in the breasts. The breasts produce milk on the third day. But in those breasts is a thick, creamy substance called colostrum. And that colostrum is rich. It's incredibly fat, fatty. It's rich and fatty, and it's very high in the mother's microorganisms. So those, that, that colostrum is absolutely vital for the development of the baby's immune system. Did you know that our immune system is established in our gut? I was talking to a farmer and he said if a, if a cow gives birth to a baby calf and the cow dies in childbirth, if we can't get colostrum to that calf, we may as well kill it because it'll never, ever be a strong cow. Isn't that interesting? A man rang me and he said, Barbara, my, my wife's in hostage, just had a baby and she's got no milk. We don't know what to do. And I said, hasn't anyone told you? The milk doesn't come in for three days. But put that baby on the breast because what that baby's getting is, it's, it's, it's gold food in the establishment of the brain, in the establishment of the gut, in the establishment of the of the immune system. Very, very important to do the way God meant it to be. In fact, the farmer said to me, if the, if the cow, cow does die and they've got a calf, they'll, they'll find a cow, another cow that's just given birth just so that that calf will get that colostrum. And people say, Barbara, you can get colostrum supplements. Should I take them? And I said, where are they from? They're from the cow. And I said, I wouldn't take them. All we need to do is to work with the body that God gave us. So when the baby breathes in the mother's gut flora and when the baby takes the colostrum, it builds a thick turf wall over the villi. 
In her book, Gut and Psychology, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, she calls it a thick turf, a thick turf wall over the lining of the small intestine. And that, that thick turf wall has a very important function. It, it's responsible for the final breakdown of our food. But didn't the food get its breakdown with the enzymes all down our gastrointestinal tract? That is true. But those, uh, that gut flora, it helps with the release of the B vitamins. And what's interesting in foods like sauerkraut, you've got a similar microbial activity to what's happening in the gut. You've got the activity of lactobacillus acidophilus, and that releases B vitamins. This gut flora also is responsible for the absorption. Do you remember I said this is the, this is the grand finale of digestion? It's that gut flora that's responsible for helping take the nutrients out of the food and into the blood, or if it's an unsaturated fat, into the lacteal. That gut flora is responsible for protection. The gut flora protects the blood from any harmful pathogens that may be in the gut. And that gut flora nourishes the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. So it plays an important, pole in, important role in nourishment. The gut flora is very important. I mentioned Hippocrates, who said, let food be our medicine and medicine be our food. But you know what he also said? All disease begins in the gut. Remember, it's a hollow tube. And what happens in that gut is vital in the release of nutrients into our blood and thus to our cells. And yet, unfortunately, many people are doing things that are killing off the gut flora. So what would kill off the gut flora? Antibiotics do a good job. I'm not against antibiotics. They save lives, and they will continue to save lives. Our body can cope with about two courses in a lifetime. Did you hear that? about two courses in a lifetime. And the other, well, it was yesterday, wasn't it? I showed you how the, the garlic is a very potent antibiotic. Olive leaf extract is another good one. You see, antibiotics, one writer said, it's like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. What did the atomic bomb do? It killed off the good and the bad alike. So even though it does kill bacteria, if it's getting out of control in your body, it will kill, also kill off the good bacteria. You might have heard of Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori is a naturally occurring bacteria in the gut. But when it gets out of control, <laughs> then it can cause problems. But God gave us something to keep it under control. It's called hydrochloric acid. If your hydrochloric acid's strong, it'll keep it under control. <laughs> So if someone says to me, I've got Helicobacter pylori, I say, fantastic, we all have. It's only when it's out of control, it's a problem. And I've had people say to me, I'm on my fourth course of antibiotics now, and I've still got Helicobacter pylori. Now, what's the definition of insanity? It's to do what you've always done and expect different results. What we do is we give herbs to boost hydrochloric acid, and that will automatically bring Helicobacter under control. See, the body runs according to precision balance. And one of the problems with antibiotics is that it kills off the good flora in the gut. Uh, statin drugs all kill off the flora in the gut. Long-term painkillers kill off the flora in the gut. A high refined sugar diet kills off the flora in the gut. So how can we replace that? Just about every country I go to, traditionally, they all had a cultured food. In Europe, it's sauerkraut. It's also the sourdough bread. In Asia, it's the miso and also your tofus so you, and yogurts, kefirs. You can make very nice kefir and yogurts on uh, coconut milk or soy milk. What these foods do is they... Uh, they encourage the growth of lactobacillus acidophilus, which causes a breakdown in the food. So when you're eating those foods, that like it's a preservative for the food. That's why the, the uh, Europeans have always done it, to preserve their cabbages through the winter. But it also is very good at 
causing a, a maintenance or even a build-up of the good bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. And so when I said we've come to the, to the, uh, the final celebration of nutrients into our gut, it's under the action of those microbes. Most of our food is absorbed, well all of it really should be, halfway down the small intestine. What's left is insoluble cellulose or fibre. And then it comes down and it comes through the ileocecal valve. This is a one-way valve because we don't want anything from the colon going back into the small intestine. But notice this little formation at the bottom, it's called the appendix. Did you know that God never makes mistakes? And the appendix has an important role. The appendix does two, two things in the gut. It's called the colon's oil can, so it lubricates the contents and helps it to come through much greater ease. And if anything that's coming out of the small intestine is toxic, then antibacterial fluid is released by the appendix to calm it down on its way through the, uh, the large intestine. So the appendix are very important. Why would the appendix swell? Usually because they're overworked, often because of what's coming through the gastrointestinal tract is toxic. Why would it be toxic? When meat breaks down, it putrefies. When vegetables break down, they ferment. The putrefaction process is toxic. Let's say peop someone had meat and then they had ice cream for dessert, that high sugar and then alcohol and then coffee and sugar in the coffee. Wow, that's a, that's a toxic mix and by the time it's getting down here, it's toxic. Dogs can get away with eating meat because their gastrointestinal tract is only six foot long. Ours is about... Uh, I'll have to go back to meters because I know meters. So our gut's... Our gut is eight metres long, so you would say that a yard, yeah? Um, a metre would be about a yard. So dogs have one metre or one yard, whereas humans have eight metres or eight yards long. And so by the time that meat is getting through here, it is putrefying pretty badly. But if the person eats it with a lot of vegetables, the fermentation from the vegetables can calm it down somewhat. It's very important that the food coming through the large intestine is high in fibre, which stimulates peristalsis and cleans out all the little pockets. Meat has no fibre. All your refined foods have no fibre. So it's not uncommon that things get stuck. And because there is no fibre, the peristalsis closes down. Dr Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations. He said going once a day is constipation. It's a good idea why you shouldn't eat 10 times a day, is that right? <laughs> but if you notice that your colon has a mind of its own, it, it won't do what you tell it. If you've got diarrhea and you tell it to stop, it won't. And if you've got constipation and tell it to go, it won't. No, the colon has a mind of its own. And it needs the right conditions. It needs a high fibre diet. It needs you to be well lubricated. And what lubricates is water. We should be having at least eight glasses of water a day. Start early <laughs> and have it little by little by little all through the day. When you're dehydrated, more water gets taken out than should be taken out and that leaves uh, rabbit pellets and cement. The colon needs to be exercised. When you exercise, you are massaging the colon. So when I was running up hills this morning, my colon was getting a nice massage. Rebounder. When you're on the rebounder, your colon's getting a nice massage. Push-ups. Does everyone do push-ups? Everyone should. If you can't do push-ups on the floor, do them on the wall, but strengthen this, this upper body. Every exercise that you do massages the colon, particularly your core strengthening. If you want a strong back, strengthen your core, because all the muscles in your core are all linked to your spine. So this is where your Pilates type exercises, the core strengthening exercises are important. So that, so it sounds like the eight laws of health, doesn't it? Apply it to the, you can, you can apply those, those eight laws to every part of your gastrointestinal tract for it to be running, running well. But what can you do if it's not running well? What can you do if you're only going once a day or if you're only going once a week? and yet you've impl implemented the eight laws of health, there are herbs that will help 
In fact, you can get uh, aloe vera, you can get aloe vera uh, tablets that can stimulate this. You can put a castor oil compress on the abdomen, that will help, that'll penetrate and help movement. And there are herbs that can help that. What about if you're going too much? One man came to us, he was going 10 times a day, that's too much. So you've got to listen to the body, you've got to listen to the body signs. So what can you do if it's going too much? There's a herb called Slipriol. And Slipriol is the powdered bark of the Slipriol tree. And Slipriol has a growth stimulant in it. It coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut. And when you put water with it, it goes a bit thick. And in that thickness, it coats, soothes the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. We had a man uh, do our program who was going 10 times a day. He was on cortisone. He was also on anti-inflammatories. He was about 40. And he was having, unbeknownst to him, foods that were irritating. So I want to show you what foods irritate. These foods don't irritate every gut, but if the gut is already irritated, it's going to irritate it much more. So wheat. In my next lecture, I'm going to show you exactly what they've done to the wheat. But it was hybridized in the 1950s, and it created a starch structure and a, a protein or a gluten structure. It's very difficult to digest. Dairy. It is irritating to the lining of the gut, especially the cow's milk and the cheese. The cheeses are one of the worst. Refined sugar. This is like kerosene to a fire when you've got an inflamed gut. And I also find oats or oatmeal. I'll say oatmeal. My sons eat oatmeal for breakfast every day and they love it. Well, they can. They haven't got an inflamed gut. And with the inflamed gut, that can be called irritable bowel, IBS, it can be Crohn's disease, it can be colitis or ulcerative colitis, it can be gastritis. The names indicate different parts of the gastrointestinal tract, but it's all inflammation, so you have to handle it very carefully. And the only f thing that's touching that gut is the food that we eat. And I find when people have an inflamed gut, raw food, they must not eat, because that can, that can irritate the lining of the gut. So they've got to have vegetables, cooked vegetables, that's nice and soft. Rice, even white rice. <laughs> that's soft on the gastrointestinal tract. It's not forever, it's just until we calm this down, calm it down. And so with this man, the first two days at Misty Mountain, on juices, we gave him slippery oil four times a day. We gave it to him at eight o'clock, we gave it to him midday, we gave it to him at six o'clock, and then another dose just before I went to bed. And after two days, I said, how are you going? He said, very good. He said, I'm not bleeding from the bowel anymore. He said, I'm not getting the terrible cramps. And he said, I've gone from 10 times a day down to six times a day. That's quite incredible. That's 48 hours. So at the end of the Wednesday, and Wednesday is the day that our guests eat, I said, how are you going? He said, very good. He said, no cramping, no bleeding from the bowel. And he said, and I'm four times a day. That's incredible. See, the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract, they're made every three to five days. So once you give the gut the right conditions, response should be happening very quickly. One lady said to me, I've been suffering from this for 30 years. 30 years. <laughs> so by Thursday, this man's going four times a day and it's got form, that's incredible. I said to him, I believe you can, if you choose to, you can stop your anti-inflammatories, because that tells me the inflammation's right down. He did. Now, if he started to go more and more and more, we've got a choice then where we can go back on maybe half-dose anti-inflammatories, or we can just do slippery elm every hour. That's what I'd choose to do, but nothing happened. The cortisone, be very cautious with that. That has to be come off very, very slowly. I said, if this stays like this, I believe that in another week, 
you could go from 20 milligrams of cortisone down to 15. Try that for two, a few more weeks, then come down to 10. You have to go down very, very slowly. Because if he comes off too quickly, then he could get this big inflammatory response. We've seen that happen to so many people. How simple is that? And it's such good news. Very important to listen and watch the body's response. So now we're coming down to right at the end of the colon, and there's a, a muscle here. It's called puborectalis. And this muscle holds up the last part of the large intestine. And we're very glad for that muscle because it means we don't have accidents. Now I need to draw the throne here. So here's the throne. And here's someone sitting on the throne doing their morning evacuation. Puborectalis remains taunt. It remains tight. Things can still get through. But if that person on the throne with their morning evacuation puts a little stool in front of the throne so that they are mimicking the squatting position and their knees are up in the air, that squatting position causes puborectalis to relax. And when puborectalis relaxes, the colon opens up and the contents pass with much greater ease. It also takes all pressure off the anus. Never should we push. We should have the squatting position and just allow it to come out naturally. When we push, we put a lot of pressure on the anus and that's when hemorrhoids can happen. What can you do for hemorrhoids? Get a little stool, you can go to Bed Bath Beyond and get Squatty Potty, that's what it's called. <laughs> and it's a little stool that sits around the base of the throne. You can also use some suppositories to help with hemorrhoids. You can get strips of aloe vera gel and freeze them and then insert that at night. Or you can get cotton wool, moisten it with castor oil and mould it to the size of your little finger and freeze that. I'm warning you, it can take nearly a week to freeze. Because of course you cannot insert it unless it's solid. But they can certainly help with hemorrhoids. But in the next step, we need to find out why the hemorrhoids are there. Is it because the person's not drinking enough water? Is it because they're not exercising? Is it because they're not eating enough fibre? And so ends our journey through the gastrointestinal tract. We've got time to take a few questions before we have a break, yes? Gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is where the, it's restricted, yeah? It's restricted up here. Well, we had a lady who had the gastroparesis. That's a tightening of the esophagus. And she had it because she had a tumour. And they did radiotherapy and chemotherapy on the tumour, which damaged the esophagus. And now she has to have it uh, open. They have to put rods down it to sort of stretch it every two months. But she's been putting castor oil on her throat. And the last time she went to have it stretched, the surgeon said, this is strange, it's just slipped through. It's not tightening like it usually does. So with this lady, I just told you why she had it and what she did to help. So. It's also, it's important to look at the person's history and find out what, what has happened there. Yes? If somebody were to take uh, like enzyme supplements uh, to break down protein, like tryptin or amyotrypsin or protein, would that uh, like prevent your body from continuing to, um, to produce it? Or yeah, it's a good, it's a good, Good question. If you were taking uh, digestive enzymes, would that eventually stop your body doing it? If it was long term, if it was long term, perhaps. But if you're looking at reviving your pancreas, 
Meanwhile, it's important to take the digestive enzymes, yeah? So could you take a protein drink and put the enzymes in to help with the protein? Personally, I say not, because it's far better to let your body do it. You're far better to have a bit of cayenne pepper or lemon juice. See, what that does is revive your body to do the job. So the digestive enzymes are really only necessary in someone that, that has a pancreas that's not working well. Yes? Uh, herbs to help with hydrochloric acid. Uh, the herbs for hydrochloric acid are the bitter herbs. So in my book, Self Heal by Design, I have a bitter drink in there. It's got gentian, very bitter, golden seal, very bitter, uh, dandelion, very bitter, and also licorice, which coats, and it's made with fresh ginger. Even just a fr um, hot ginger tea, that, that'll, that'll cause a release. Yes? What can you do to help a weak bladder? Now, usually if it's a weak bladder, that's muscular because the, the urethra is a muscle. And one of the best exercises to help that is rebounding. That's the uh, trampoline, the little trampoline. But I'm, I warn people, empty your bladder first. But also, when you urinate, it's a good idea to stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, because it's a muscle. And so what you need to do is just strengthen that muscle. So it's activity that will strengthen it, yes? Yeah, I can answer that. What can you do for someone that can't stop eating? Well, they need to go on their knees <laughs> and ask Jesus to empower their prefrontal cortex because the decision to eat is made in the prefrontal cortex. And if they're in habit of eating, they can get out of the habit of eating. But nobody and no herb can do anything for them. It must come from them. Yes? The, the best natural suppressant for appetite is the will. Really, just I will not, I feel hungry, I will have water. And she'll get better at it. And remember the three things that keep the food in the stomach longer, are fiber, protein, and, and your good fats. In the diabetic lecture next, we'll actually explore food a little bit more. But really, that, that is the answer. Yes? What can a woman do if she's not producing enough milk for her newborn? Remember, the milk doesn't come in for three days, and the breasts, the stimulation at the nipples uh, and the brain are closely connected, and it's just demand and supply. So when my first baby was born, she was preemie. When she was two weeks old, she got whooping cough because she didn't get my colostrum because I had hepatitis, so I expressed. And so when she had whooping cough for six weeks, she was hospitalized, and I was getting probably, uh, let me see, ounces, your ounces. Maybe I was getting um, 10 ounces of milk a day out of my breast, hardly anything. And I had a book called The Womanly Heart of Breastfeeding. And in that book, it said, the more you feed, the more milk will be made. And so for a while, I just put her on every hour. I just put her on every hour, every hour I just put her on. And I've got a photo of Emma, this skinny little four-month-old baby, and then a five-month-old baby. <laughs> and all I did was put her on the breast more. Now, I agree we need to have breaks between babies' food, but you're just doing this to build the supply. And milk thistle, milk thistle is called milk thistle because of its ability to help produce more milk, and also purslane, 
purslane is a herb, it just grows in the garden. It apparently can help, but really the best is just keep putting that baby on until that milk comes up. And I know that when my baby had a cold or, you know, were sick with a fever, I just let them feed as much as they want because I wanted them to have the fluids and they fed a lot. And then three days later, I had so much milk <laughs> because for a couple of days, the baby had been on a light. So it, that's, all, that's all it is. And I met a lady in Papua New Guinea and she was in her 50s and she had a baby. And I said, is that your baby? She said, it's actually a street girl's baby. If a, woman, if a girl gets pregnant in Papua New Guinea, she's thrown out of the home. So she said, I took the baby. And then I'm giving meetings and I look down and this woman is breastfeeding this baby. And I went to her later and I said, you're breastfeeding the baby. She said, yes. She said, at first I had to supplement, but I just kept putting the baby on. I just kept putting the baby on. Now this 57-year-old woman is fully breastfeeding this nine-month-old baby. <laughs> so if even that can happen, how much more if a woman is already feeding? And the worst thing that can happen is for the woman to start supplementing with a formula. Because the less the baby sucks at the breast, the less milk will be made. Just, just put that baby on more and more. We've got time for one more question. We'll have a break, yes? Yes. Okay, I can tell you exactly what happens there. The only organ in the body that has fructose receptors is the liver. So when people are eating food with high fructose corn syrup, they're eating a lot of fruit, they're having a lot of fruit juice, there's too much fructose going into the liver. And what the liver usually does it'll convert the fructose to glucose and the glucose goes to the cell. But when, when you've got this overload of fructose, the only thing that the liver can do is store it as fat on the liver. So it's the high fructose diet that is causing the fatty liver because the liver is the only organ that fructose receptor sites. So don't eat anything that's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. It's a dangerous sweetener. And I don't drink juice. The only time I drink juice would be if there's a bit of carrot juice left over at the health centre. We should be drinking water. But a lot of people are drinking juice instead of water. And the high fruit diet is just too much fructose. Too much fructose. But I think we'll have a break now. We'll have some more questions with our next lecture. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have one announcement to make. If any of you brought food for the a fellowship lunch today and your dishes are still in the kitchen. Can we please ask you to uh, take them out during the break to your cars? We have a funeral also that some church members are needing to prepare for and they need the kitchen to be free of our lunch dishes. <laughs> okay, so let's have a word of prayer and have take a, well, I guess a 30 minute break. 10 minutes? Ten minute? You want us to start at 20 till? Okay. All right, we'll do that, so um, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you that um, we are here today again and for this message on the gut and how to treat it best. I pray that you will be with each person here, um, especially as they've traveled, many have traveled from such a distance. Thank you for bringing them here safely. And uh, as we take a little break now, help us to rest our minds and to be energized again for this last presentation. In Jesus' name, amen. And one more thing, if you have not contributed to Barbara's ministry and would like to, there, put your um, contribution in a tight envelope and you can put it in the box or you can give it to me and we'll be sure she gets it. <laughs> 